Okay, so thanks so much, Scott, for the invitation and to, and to all of NAPWA for inviting me to, to come and talk to you today. I think I've met most of you before, but for those of you who I haven't met, um, I wear various hats as we all do. I'm the president of Thorn Harbour Health, which was formerly the Victorian AIDS Council here in Victoria. Um, that's kind of my voluntary on the side uh, community role. And then as my day job, I work at the Burnett Institute for Medical Research and Public Health, uh, where I'm the regional director for our programs in the Mekong region. And I look after some of our HIV bilateral programs in, in Papua New Guinea. My background, uh, actually, I, I mean, I do have undergrad university majors in medical virology and in immunology, so can talk to the science, but I haven't worked in a laboratory or clinical work for quite a long time. So um, my work now kind of pertains to the translation of research data to practice and policy in, in resource poor settings. But as Scott said, I'll answer the few questions that came through from, from some of you beforehand, and then hopefully if I don't go over time and just shut me off any time if I'm talking too much, um, I'll get to some fielding some questions from you as well at the end of, of this session. Okay, so a few caveats on, on the presentation. One is about the peril of interpreting early data. Um, so when, when you look at uh, the normal process of medical research or, or social research in terms of public health, it's a long process and it takes from, from the beginning of the idea where you come up with your hypothesis that you're going to question through to actually publishing that data in the peer-reviewed literature. It's normally years where that, where that happens because first you have to do the community consultations, get your hypothesis, develop your research protocol, then go through quite lengthy ethics applications um, and wait on those. Then you do the actual Im implementation of the study where you, you go and you uh, enroll, you know, patients in a clinical study or, or participants in a social study and collect that data. Then there's a long period of analysis of that data, uh, writing up the papers with all of the co-authors, and then it goes to the peer-reviewed journals for publication. What we're seeing now is people pumping out papers within a week or two of trialing something um, from, a, from an idea. And, that, and that's partly because there's a sense of urgency with this and we need to learn quickly so we can respond. But what we're also seeing is that papers that come out are then disproven sometime later. So you, your classic hydroxychloroquine um, paper where that was going to be the panacea for everyone and then proven not to be effective. So all of the data I'm presenting today is from the, the peer reviewed literature. Um, but the caveat is that it's all kind of new data and it may be disproven later. Also to, to point out the, the type of trials and studies that we're getting data from are not the gold standard. So the gold standard is a randomized control trial, basically where you enroll um, different people into the trial and some people go on the actual um, intervention. So they get the drugs that we're trying to trial, for example, and other people get the placebo. And then you do a statistical analysis of significance between the two to see whether there's an effect or not. But they take a long time, so they're all underway in terms of treatment, but we're not getting that much data yet. In terms of social research that helps us understand who might be more predisposed to contracting coronavirus or to having bad clinical outcomes, your, your best option is a cohort study where you enrol people and then you follow them over a long period of time. And the longer um, you follow them for them, the, the cleaner the data is. Um, and then, so for example, you, you enroll people and then look for the outcome in the future or down the track. But because we don't have a timeline here, we're doing cross-sectional studies, which means at a point in time, you look at, for example, all the people in the hospital who are being intubated for COVID-19 with the worst um, clinical symptoms. And then you go back and say, okay, how many of those people smoke cigarettes? Or how many of those people have diabetes? Or how many of those people have hypertension? And then you can only make a correlation between, well, there seems to be more people with, um, you know, the illness and with hypertension, for example. But the limitation to that is that it's not causative. So you can't prove that the hypertension actually caused you to end up in the hospital with bad case of COVID. So there's no causal element to cross-sectional studies. So that's a bit of a limitation there as well. Also low sample sizes in all of these studies, because until recently there wasn't that many people who had had COVID. 19. Now we're getting a lot more people in the US, so we'll get more data coming forward. A lack of peer review 
because people are just publishing off and without it, it going through those proper peer reviewed process. And we also need to make sure there's replicability in studies. So if someone says that a study has proven something, other people need to repeat that study either with the same methodology or slightly amended methodologies to prove that the first person's findings were correct. Um, so they're all caveats to explain that the science is not perfect and we're learning day by day as we go forward here. So just to sort of set the scene, and, and you're probably all sick of hearing about coronaviruses, as, as I think we all are, but they are a, a group of RNA viruses, the same as HIV, which is also an RNA virus. Uh, they're found naturally in mammals and birds. Obviously, humans are a mammal, so we are susceptible to being infected with coronaviruses. You can see in the, the diagram there with the pictures um, that you know they're found in nature, mostly in bats and, and rodents, uh, where they don't cause any pathogenesis and you don't actually um, you know, see sickness necessarily in the animal. It's when they jump from that species to another species and then they can jump from the, the secondary species to humans that we start to get a problem. So the ones that we know of that have caused severe illness in the last few years being MERS or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome or SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, uh, MERS comes from camels after coming from bats and SARS came from civet cats in, in Asia, we believe. SARS-CoV-2, which is the one we're talking about now, uh, probably jumped from bats to a pangolin or something similar in the wet market and then jumped on to, to humans. Um, interestingly, corona actually means crown in Spanish. So if you look at the electromicrograph picture of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 there, there's three of the right um, you can see that glycoproteins around the end, which are also the attachment agents that, that help that virus attach to our cells. And they're supposed to look like a crown, which is where the name for these viruses come from. We've had coronaviruses with us for a long time. Most of them cause just a mild common cold alongside the rhinoviruses. Um, and then there's the ones that are more lethal. In terms of terminology, I think it'd be an interesting exercise for people to ask their family and friends, you know, what is the name of the virus that causes COVID-19, and I'm sure probably less than 1% of the, of the population would be able to answer that question correctly, considering how long we've spent trying to educate communities and the media about the difference between HIV and AIDS, and that one is the virus and one is the syndrome and all that. We don't do such a good job with this, but the infectious agent is actually SARS-CoV-2, which means severe acute respiratory syndrome, and a COVID virus is the second one in those line the type or the family of the virus for HIV. It's a retrovirus, which we, we know incorporates its, D, its RNA into our DNA. And the coronavirus is the family here. And then the disease or the syndrome, which is a collection of symptoms that we have and we know with its AIDS, the, the equivalent here is COVID-19. So just to clear up some of the terminology around that for people. Chad, so, I'm, I'm sorry to, to butt in, but we've had a request in the chat line, if you could, would you mind just putting your presentation into um, uh, into the, the the play mode or the the slide view sure. mode? Some people are having trouble seeing them. Is is all in that? How's that? Thank you. That's great. Excellent. Okay, so COVID nineteen, which is the disease, you know, has varied clinical outcomes. The same as HIV has varied clinical outcomes for for each of us. Some people have you know a very severe um, zero conversion illness, other people report none. Some people can live with HIV for a long time with no symptoms and others get ill much quicker. So with all pathogens, as they interact with us as humans, as the host, there's the interplay between the host and the host genetics and the host's physiology and the pathogen. It's very markedly different from people to people. So there's no standard COVID-19 experience for, for anyone. And the spectrum of clinical pre presentations goes really from people who are asymptomatic or, or don't have any illness at all or don't report any illness through to obviously at the other end of the spectrum mortality. Um, asymptomatic infections are a problem for us in terms of a public health approach in trying to track people who may be carrying the infection and shedding virus and spreading it unknowingly in the community. Um, and then the next sort of one is pre-symptomatic and I'll get to this a little bit later, but Obviously, after you've become infected with the virus, there's a period of time before you actually develop any symptoms. Um, and so you, it doesn't mean you're asymptomatic. You're asymptomatic at that point in time, but we call it pre-symptomatic because you are going to develop symptoms at some point. Um, 
in a lot of studies so far, people who have had a test uh, and then turned out, you know, from PCR to be positive for the virus, but have reported no symptoms, later on develop some symptoms in the, in the second week of their infection. Most people get a mild infection and report perhaps just having a slight, you know, sore throat or, or something and often don't go and seek medical care or a test because of that. Um, then there's the typical one which we hear about with the sore throat, the fever, the loss of breath, the fatigue, the anosmia, which is that loss of um, the sense of smell because of the, the damage the virus does to the upper respiratory tract. And then obviously that if you can't smell, you can't taste. So there's a, a loss in, in that as well. And then for the more severe cases that we hear about, the people who are hospitalised, uh, this typically happens in the second week of infection when the body starts to actually respond to the presence of the pathogen. So it's not the presence of, of SARS-CoV-2 in the body necessarily that kills people straight away. It's when the, the immune system starts to respond that they get that really severe um, reaction and end up needing to go into hospital and, and be intubated. Obviously, mortality is not a great outcome, but it does happen. Uh, recovery is the outcome we're looking for and full recovery, particularly if we get full recovery with an immune response to protect people in the future. We are getting reports of people who have recovery but ongoing organ damage, you know, from the virus affecting their heart and, and lungs and other organs perhaps more permanently. Uh, there are some reports of related syndromes, particularly in young children, uh, like toxic shock, toxic shock syndrome, but Studies are not clear yet whether that's actually linked to this current pandemic or not. Um, and then we get people now reporting atypical symptoms, so things that are not on the standard list, but um, people are having varied experiences of, of what this virus does to them and how it affects them and how long it takes them to recover anywhere from a few days to several hundred weeks. So just to bring it back to you know, the pertinence of this discussion, which is about the interplay between HIV and SARS-CoV-2. Um, the good news is that there's no direct association with SARS-CoV-2 infection, so poor disease progression and clinical outcomes for people living with HIV. So it means you're not more likely to get it if you're HIV positive than anyone else. It means your disease progression is not typically going to be different to anyone else's because you're HIV positive and your clinical outcome is not going to be different depending on your HIV either. So that's good news for the community in terms of you know, not having to have that extra heightened level of fear associated with being HIV positive. And this seems to play out even during, um, for people who are uh, immunosuppressed, so have low CD4 counts. In fact, in Australia, Edwin Wright, who many of you know, is doing some research uh, looking at CD4 count of 300 as a cutoff point to explore further where there's an elevated risk for people with suppressed immunity, but we suspect that um, there won't be. In fact, th there are some arguments that having a very suppressed immune system might be protective in that you don't get that massive cytokine storm in the second week, which puts you in hospital. What seems to be the issue, and this is an issue for our community, is that it's that interplay between being infected with the coronavirus and the comorbidities. So 41% of people who are hospitalized seem to have obesity, which seems to be the greatest factor for, for when people may or may not end up needing um, you know, hospitalization after they become infected. Many also have heart disease, but obesity is that main factor. And, and the only link there to HIV is that many of our community uh, um, do have these underlying comorbidities like heart problems, hypertension, and obesity. If you look at high caseload clinics in Australia, we know that the figures there, 14% of people are obese and many people have hypertension or, <clears throat> or other heart problems to begin with. So that means those people in our community need to be protected um, a little bit more. In terms of looking at reducing your hypertension and your blood pressure, uh, there have been reports that ACE inhibitor drugs, which many people take, uh, will you know, protect people, but this has not really been substantiated yet. On the question of PrEP and COVID-19 protection or outcomes, so tenofovir and emtricitabine, uh, the study so far shows that there is no uh, protective link for SARS-CoV-2, and that's been done in vitro, which means done in the lab rather than in, in human um, case studies. There is a Spanish observational study underway looking at tenofovir and emtricitabine and hydroxychloroquine as a treatment 
but we know that hydroxychloroquine hasn't been proven to be very effective. And if tenofovir and tricitabine don't work in the lab at reducing viral growth um, in vitro, then it's unlikely that that will also help us in terms of a treatment. Uh, COVID-19 infection does mean that your CD4 cell counts don't function so well, but that's a temporary measure, obviously, because your immune system is uh, reacting to a, a quite aggressive virus for a short period of time. But unlike HIV, people do clear this virus, so that's only a temporary measure until that virus is being cleared from their system. People often want to think about, well, what's my chance of dying from this, you know, the, the mortality figures. Um, if you look at this, you can see in, in some of the most highly affected countries, the mortality rate varies dramatically from Belgium and the UK and France, where it's up to like 15%, which is quite high, and lower in other countries like Germany. Of course, this data is underpinned by the fact that it needs to be correlated against testing. So this is the percentage of people who have had a notification um, that they are positive for the virus and what their their mortality rate outcome is, whereas we know a lot more people in society will be asymptomatic, and so the, the denominator in this calculation is therefore actually probably incorrect. If we look at all of the global data that we've got at the moment from all of these different countries represented by the yellow dots, you can see great variation there um, as you correlate deaths versus confirmed cases to try and get a true mortality rate uh, for this infection. Australia sits at around 1.4% at the moment. We have very good testing, so we're probably catching most people who are infected. So that's probably a more accurate figure of, of what that is. And it also depends, obviously, on the demographics of your population and how many people are older or have those underlying health conditions. In terms of treatment, it doesn't look good at this point in time. So the strategy here is to go through the shelves of our you know, pharmacies and go through the historical shelves of even drugs that we don't use anymore in, in any clinical um, purpose and to test them in the laboratory first to see whether they in inhibit the growth of the virus in vitro and, and then trial them in humans too to see whether they actually help people recover quicker. Pretty much we've tried every drug that exists and there is insufficient data on anything actually working uh, you can see in the Kalitra, the lopinavir and ritonavir study uh, and protease inhibitors, which are HIV drugs, also was proven to be ineffective in, in changing the clinical outcomes for somebody who had severe COVID-19. Um, the, the probable drug that is, is the best at the moment is remdesivir, um, and more studies are required to see whether we can get sufficient statistical analysis on those studies as to whether it's going to be an effect. But I think that's the one to watch. Don't go running out buying uh, hydrochloroquine or, or anything because it's probably not going to work and your Truvada drugs probably won't work either. So basically, as with all public health approaches, it's about network dynamics and socio-demographic factors. So if you think about network dy dynamics, it's the same for HIV, it's the same for other STIs. Basically, the more people you come in contact with, uh, the more likelihood that you're coming into contact with somebody who is actually carrying the virus and shedding it. Um, so we try to reduce contact between different people to reduce that chance of people coming into contact with somebody who's carrying the virus. And, and the more we can do that at a network level, the more protective it is for all of us at, at a population level. So this is all about that physical distancing, social distancing, and all these lockdown measures that we've been living with now for for quite a while. And that approach is really to, to protect the vulnerable in our population, the older people, the people with those comorbidities, but also to protect that health system, that flattening the curve to make sure that we don't crash the health system and then don't have enough uh, you know, machines to put people on if more, if more people need intubation for survival. We're not actually here in Australia looking at necessarily an elimination approach in the same way that New Zealand did, which means trying to completely eradicate the virus from our from society. If we could achieve that, that would be great. But the reality is we're not going to achieve elimination with this virus globally because it's already out of control. So even if we eliminated it in Australia, what's our option to close our borders forever and hide away on the island? And I don't think that's good for the economy or for, for any of us. So that's not the approach. It's about slowing that curve and... and and getting that down. Um, unfortunately, this virus is probably going to be with humans forever now. You know, with the other coronaviruses that cause the common cold, it's probable that when they jumped from animals to humans 
hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. They possibly also had high rates of mortality in old people and, and what we're seeing today. Um, but we've become, you know, as a population and as individuals immune to those things over time. So now we just get common cold symptoms when we, when we come into contact with them. Um, so what we're really seeing here is the birth of a new endemic virus that will be with humans forever and will um, possibly over time become less uh, in terms of morbidity and mortality. The idea here is to get that R naught factor, which you probably all know about below one. It's basically the R naught factor is, is how likely one person is to pass on the virus to another. You can see there for other viral outbreaks, what that figure is. So basically with HIV there, it says two to five. So it means one person with HIV is likely to pass that on to two to five people in their lifetime. Um, that's obviously in the absence of treatment and, and, and all the things we know that stop that, that process and halt it. Uh, if we can get the R0 below one, that means for each infected person, they're not going to infect another person or, or um, and then the chain of transmission stops. So that's the objective to get to here in terms of controlling this. If we look at risk and vulnerability, so vulnerability is about who is more likely to be exposed, and this is not equal. And risk is about who is more likely to end up with worse clinical outcomes should they become exposed. So we know with HIV, there, it's within our communities, within our societies, it's not equal in terms of who's vulnerable and who's more likely to be exposed to the virus. And it's the same here. So at the beginning, we were actually seeing it amongst, you know, richer people, people who had the money or jobs, which meant that they traveled overseas um, and sort of the Aspen ski set that returned to Melbourne all with, infected with the virus or the people who are on cruise ships because they're able to get around. I think what we're going to see as it, as it turns around to becoming local transmission is that we end up with perhaps it being less likely amongst people who are rich and able to self-isolate but more likely amongst people who have jobs that mean they have to go back to work and they have to go back to work and be in close proximity to other people like the, the, the meat factory worker the outbreak that we're seeing here in Melbourne at the moment. So not to go into detail on this, but I, I think it's a good uh, visual in terms of what we've done in Australia. This starts in January and goes up to today. You can see the new infections per day in red and you can see the different uh, policy implicate uh, sort of measures that have been put in place by our federal and our state governments in terms of blocking arrivals from other countries and locking us all down in our homes and you can see that they've had an effect in, in flattening that curve and getting it down to very low levels so we are being effective here in Australia which is great it's probably one of the best places in the world for us to be at this point in time if you look at this in comparison just really look at the the two on the left the United States and the United Kingdom you can see that they're still sort of at the peak of their first wave of this pandemic. They haven't started to see that decline yet. So they've gone up and they've stayed up, which is not great for, for people living in those countries. Um, the problem with all of this is that, you know, we can get it down to, to next to zero like we have in Australia, but then as we start reducing uh, lockdown measures and letting people open up and, and get those network dynamics moving again, we're likely to see a second or a third wave as, as we move forward. And that's what we're looking out for at the moment. How do we know we're really being effective in Australia? Well, it really requires that denominator of testing as I spoke about earlier. You can see from this graph, uh, the sort of line with the dots is the number of new notifications of positive uh, SARS-CoV-2 cases per day. And then the pink is the number of tests that we're doing nationally. So we're getting a lot fewer positive cases now and we're testing more people each day than we have been in the past, up to about 20,000 tests being done in Australia per day with very few people, you know, something like 20 people per day coming back positive, which is evidence that we are actually being um, really effective as a country in controlling this, this pandemic at this point in time. A little bit more about the diagnostics and the testing. So what are the options here? And you'll all be familiar with this as a, as a correlation to HIV. There are two types of tests we can do. One looks for the presence of the virus or the RNA, um, the viral RNA, and we do that through like a PCR um, amplification or through another method, uh, method called LAMP. The benefit of LAMP is that you get those results in two to three hours as opposed to a PCR, which takes a fair bit of time to run at this point in time, about 12 hour turnaround. 
on the test result. And obviously we want to, to identify people very quickly if they're, um, they're positive in shedding the virus so we can put in measures to protect them from passing that on to other people. They're the tests that we're doing in Australia at the moment. Uh, we also therefore want, and there are in play antibody tests, which will tell people that you have been exposed to the virus and you have um, had that infection in the past because you may no longer be infective, but it just tells you that you have been exposed and you therefore perhaps have some um, immune response, uh, which may protect you in the future. We're not quite sure how much that is. The problem with the point of care antibody tests is that, you know, they're qualitative, not quantitative. So they say, yes, you've had it, but they don't tell, tell you how many antibodies you have per mill of blood, for example. So it doesn't tell you whether you have a very strong immune response that will protect you from a second infection down the track. And the antibody tests, the point of care ones, use ELISA in the same way that their enzyme links in immunosorbent assay, the same way that we do for HIV. I really like this, um, and I think it's important, and, and it will look familiar to some of you in terms of you've seen similar ones on HIV, and, and when the test shows positivity for HIV as an antibody test, and when it shows positivity for HIV as a, um, you know, as a RNA test PCR, if you look to the left, that's when somebody actually becomes exposed to the virus. And you can see on the left-hand side of that dotted black line, that there is a period of time, probably about a week, that people are shedding the virus, but asymptomatic. So that's where we've got pre-symptomatic people. So they would move around in society, not having any symptoms, not realizing they've been exposed and be infectious to, to other people. And that, and that comes from, as you can see down the bottom, nasopharyngeal swabs, virus coming from the respiratory tract, um, stool samples a little bit later on. Uh, but sputum samples as well. So that's the, that's the trouble point, is that you're going to have people infectious, moving around, infecting others, and if you try and test them, they'll come up uh, with a negative response, both to antibodies and both to a PCR for the RNA. And then people move into a phase where they're PCR positive. So we will be able to check presence of the virus from those nasal swabs and the, and the throat swabs but they won't have any antibodies at that point. It's kind of like the window period, I guess, for, for SARS-CoV-2, where you're infected, but if you do an antibody test, it comes back negative. And then obviously after some point in time, when you clear the virus, your, PCA, your PCR becomes negative and your antibodies continue on. We don't know how long those antibodies will last yet because we're new to this virus, but um, if the antibodies are like the ones we get from an influenza vaccine, they'll last three or four months before they're no longer protective. If the antibodies that you you get, for example, when you're um, exposed to something like the chickenpox, they'll last a long, a lot longer. So hopefully, it's the second scenario rather than the first. So what happens next? Um, this is the question on all of our tongues, I think. And and with the national sort of council meeting today, I'm going to make some announcements. I think tonight to us, everyone sits in the country with bated breath, waiting to hear what's going to happen. This is a model that was developed, which we've been advising the Victorian government about here that Burnett put together. And it really just shows that the way we come out of this is in phases rather than coming out of it straight away. So we're not going to get an announcement tonight that life goes back to normal and it's business as usual and everyone get on with your existence because the virus hasn't gone away and it won't go away. In fact, in, in discussions earlier this week with the Victorian Chief Medical Officer, kind of learnt, which will be part of the announcement. I think the announcement tonight's federal um, level, but each state and territory will have their own advice as well, depending on the jurisdiction you, you guys all live in, is that we're gonna end up with waves of release. So they'll, they'll release us from um, some restrictions, then they'll sit back and wait for three to four weeks to see whether a second wave starts up. And if there's no second wave, it means that release of restrictions was um, safe to do. And then they'll try releasing a few more and then sit back for three or four weeks and wait to see whether there's a second wave. And if nothing, three or four weeks later, release more. And, we're, and the plan is at least in Victoria for between four to five different um, monthly episodes of releasing restrictions bit by bit. It doesn't all happen at once. You can see from the top of the graph, that the focus on the first releases will be on economic and educational freedoms. Obviously, they're linked. 
we can't really get the economy going again until we get schools going because a lot of people are doing home schooling and also trying to do their jobs at the same time. So getting kids back into school is important from an economic perspective. Um, and then only later in the phase where we start to get more recreational freedoms where we can start to move again. This is a nice kind of diagram. It's quite complicated, but um, you know, these slides will be shared with you. You can look at it later. It really highlights that the approach to how we're addressing this as a public health um, crisis comes from a lot of learning from HIV in that you need a whole of society response and you need to be ethical and equitable. You need right government and operations. You need community engagement. You need the right information. You need all these principles of cooperation and collaboration that we're all so good at and we can help um, you know, teach the rest of the public health system about how we've got communities and health systems to work together and governments to address HIV and how that's important for here. So we need that, that whole of society response. But what does it mean as an individual? So fair enough, it's a public health approach. Um, and the whole idea is to protect older people and to protect the health system. But as individuals, we sit here in our houses and we think, well, do I want to go outside and mix with people? Do I, am I scared of getting this? What are my underlying comorbidities as someone living with HIV or as someone with, you know, hypertension or a little bit overweight? What is the implication for us? And, and I think coming from this weekend in particular, we're going to need more nuanced messages for our communities because at the moment it might be no hookups, no going out, no, um, no you know, social distancing. But as we slowly get releases from the government, what do we tell our communities about what they can do? And I think this is useful for me in terms of, of how you look at it. So when you look at risk, there's the likelihood that an event will happen in the, the Y axis here. And in the X axis, you can see the consequence of that event happening to you. And we use this for, you know, organizational board related risk or for every kind of risk in, in our lives, um, be they individual or, or organizational. So really where you want to be is in the top left-hand corner where the chance of you getting something is very rare. And if you do get it, it's insignificant. And then you don't really need to worry. Where you don't want to end up is in the bottom right-hand corner where it's very likely, if not almost certain, that you're going to end up with a particular condition. And then the consequence of that is extreme. Where I'd place us, and I don't know if you can see the mouse moving there, I think at this point with the Australian pandemic is that we're probably on this second line here on the x-axis, which is that it's unlikely that any of us at this point would come into contact with the virus and become exposed because there is such little amounts of community transmission going on, and particularly if you're in South Australia or the Northern Territory or, or jurisdictions that are doing very well, as opposed to living in a big city like Sydney or, or Melbourne. Um, you know, and then for most of us, depending on your age and your other health conditions, you know, the, the implications of us getting this are either insignificant that you may have an asymptomatic case or minor in terms of you'll be a little bit sick for a couple of weeks, but you'll recover. So we're in this sort of zone here, the green zone, which is a good place to be. But for some of us, you know, depending on our health and our age and other things, the, the likelihood of you getting it is still there in terms of the second line, very low but the consequences are potentially greater should you get it and move into more major, which might be hospitalization or extreme, which means being intubated and, and perhaps even worse outcomes. So it becomes a personal choice about what people want to take in terms of their risk going forward. And I think we need to craft messages that are factual around that for our communities in terms of what they do as we hear the government saying, you can now socialize or you can now have people come into your house or you can now go to a restaurant. What does that mean for us? And how do we nuance those messages going forward? So what is the path to the end? And the end would be elimination for any pathogen where we, we remove it from the human species. The only pathogen that we've successfully removed from, from the human species was smallpox. So we don't do, we don't do great at this. Um, we almost got there with polio, but that's making a resurgence now. And unfortunately with COVID-19, meaning health workers can't get into communities, it's probably gonna come back more. And really we require a vaccine. We don't have any vaccines for any of the coronaviruses. We never have achieved that, so it's not looking good, to be honest. Also, 
vaccine research development cycle is long. It takes 10 to 20 years from starting to do the research to having that manufactured and out there in the communities where people can access a, a viable vaccine that works. They're talking about having a vaccine ready by 2021 because everyone's accelerating the work globally on this. I mean, even at the Burnett, we're doing research on COVID-19 to try and find a vaccine. Um, I think that's very optimistic. I am hopeful that it works because that's our way forward and our way out and getting back to something resembling what the life was like before this because it'll never go back to normal. Um, but that would help give us, you know, all a sense of protection and security to go out and see people and mingle and maybe travel and do all the things that we, we like doing in our life. Um, so they're trying to truncate a 10 to 15 year process down to one year. And even if they find one that's viable and works, how do we then fund that manufacturer that, that on scale to the point where we can have, you know, there's 8 billion of us on the earth. We may need, as you, you know, with some vaccines, you need two or three doses like the hepatitis B vaccine before you actually have immunity. So, you know, 8 million people times, let's say three or four jabs, um, or if it's like the flu one and it only lasts every winter season, you have it every year, there's a lot of vaccine that needs to be developed. And then how do we get that vaccine to people in the highlands of Papua New Guinea or somewhere, for example, so that we're all equally and, and have equity in terms of access to this. At the moment, there are the studies for vaccines globally. There's a lot of projects underway, but there's only about five projects there that are in phase one, which means they're being used on humans. Um, and on a small number of humans, a phase one trial is tested on 20 to 30 people just to look for side effects, safety. Uh, it doesn't look at efficacy of protection, but just to make sure that the vaccine itself is not going to hurt somebody who receives it. The, the big concern for me here is that, you know, like the study in the UK, you can vaccinate somebody for a particular infection and then let them go out there and be exposed in the community to that infection coming. Sometimes it can co cause a harm further down the track because they've got that antibody response, that cell mediated immunity response ready to go. As soon as they're hit with presence of that virus again from, from somewhere else, they get a really sudden immune response because the body goes, oh, I recognize this, I need to fight it. And it's that really intense immune response that we see with the cytokine storm, which is putting people in hospitals. So the risk there is potentially that if we get the wrong vaccine um, out there, people could be end up in, in more harm than not having had the vaccine, if that makes sense, because it's going to induce a very quick, a very high level immune response once they're exposed to the virus in the community. Finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the controversial COVID safe app. Um, from a public health perspective, this is a great initiative because it helps do contact tracing uh, really quickly rather than sitting there asking all the questions about who have you been in contact with and where did you go and which supermarket and what time and that process takes forever. Um, this helps sort of make that much quicker for the public health authorities. At the moment it doesn't work I believe in terms of there's some bugs in the program that need to be worked through. Only 5 million Australians to date really have downloaded this. You need probably at least 10 million if not 15, for it to actually work as a public health protective measure. It doesn't protect you from getting COVID-19 if you have the app on your phone. It just lets you know quicker should you may have been exposed to somebody. I don't think this is necessarily the panacea. If you look at Singapore, uh, another country that's used this approach, only 20% of their citizens downloaded and, and used the app. Norway, it's 30%, and there's no country where they've really got higher than 30% of people using it, so it doesn't work necessarily in the way that, that we want. What we might need here is um, just an expanded testing system where we test everybody to try and catch those people who are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic and then isolate them from the rest of the community before they, they have a chance to pass that on. And finally, the questions that I received, and thank you to David and Kath and John for these beforehand. The first question around Ritonavir and Coletra, which is Ritonavir and, and Lapinavir. The evidence and the, the, on the screen on the right there is the peer-reviewed New English Journal of Medicine article for reference it proves that there was no, um, no impact of those drugs on, on people's treatment outcomes or their time in hospital or recovery. So unfortunately that didn't work. The second question from Kath 
is it is it correct that having an infection or virus such as influenza could result in a false negative test for COVID-19? Uh, influenza, no, the, the RNA PCR is very specific. It only works on SARS-CoV-2, so you won't get a false uh, negative at all with the, with the RNA PCR test. Uh, they are pretty much 100% effective. The, the, the reason why you might get a false negative for them at the moment is really down to three reasons. One is about the timing of the test. So if you have that test too late and you've already started to clear the virus, you're not viral shedding anymore. So it, the, the result will come back negative, even though you've had the infection. Or if you have it too early and you're not shedding virus, um, but you are infect, you are early in your infection, you, know, you won't get that result either. I mean, for an antibody test, obviously, there's that whole window period before you'll get uh, a result. The other reason you might get a false positive for for these tests is about the quality of the specimen that's taken. So I don't know whether any of you have actually had a, a coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 test. Apparently, it's very unpleasant. Um, you know, the, the swab has to be taken right at the back of the nose and right at the back of the throat. It's probably similar to those of us who have gone for other health checks and had somebody ram a cotton wool stick down the back of your throat. It's never fun. Um, and if you don't get a good specimen, then it'll come back negative because you haven't actually collected the virus from the right, the right spot in the nasopharyngeal, um, you know, and respiratory tract. And the other reason we might get false positives is the same as HIV testing. I mean, if you have a low prevalence of a pathogen in a society and you test everyone, you, if that study, if that test is not 100% uh, specific, um, you're going to get false positives. So that's why we really have been focusing on testing people who are contacts with known cases, travellers, return travellers, and people who um, are symptomatic at this point in time. Because if we went and tested the whole of Australia, we would get a lot of false positives because the prevalence is so low. And John, your question around, you know, people who are in weakened health systems in PNG or Timor Leste, if they have HIV, will they be more vulnerable because of other conditions, for example, tuberculosis? Um, I think the answer to this is that when, when a really hard-hitting new pandemic arrives on the scene like COVID-19, it's the health systems going to shock and start reorienting and pivoting their, their resources and their staff towards that. So we saw this with Ebola in West Africa, where the health system pivoted towards Ebola and dropped the ball on things like HIV and TB and people suffered and didn't get their medications and didn't get their, um, their care and support that they needed because everyone refocused to Ebola. So we're trying to make sure that health systems in these countries respond to the coronavirus, but don't drop the ball on the other more endemic pathogens that we've been living with and trying to deal with for a long time. In fact, in some countries, we're seeing a positive outcome in the sense that uh, it's forced people with lockdown rules to move forward and expedite policies, which we've been trying to work on for a long period of time, um, and they've happened overnight. So, for example, in PNG, you used to be able to get one month of ART, and then you'd have to come back a month later. Now they've changed that policy to you can pick up six months, understanding that people might be locked down in the house for a long time. They can get a, a good supply of ART in their house. So that's, that's a really positive step forward for people. The same in Myanmar where I work, we've seen after 20 years of trying to get take home methadone on the agenda, overnight when Corona hit, they, um, they allowed take home methadone doses in the understanding that people would not be able to move but they would need their methadone so the policy moves quickly so that's I mean there's some positive examples of of things happening as a result of this but yeah, mostly overall the problem is if we spend all of the money in these countries on coronavirus and PPE like buying masks and sanitizer there'll be nothing left to buy the ARV drugs and, and others I might stop there